and welcome to worship with First United Church of Oak Park. First United is a reformed church of two denominations, the United Church of Christ and the Presbyterian Church USA. We are an open and affirming, more light congregation, meaning if you or someone you love is a member of the LGBTQ plus community, we embrace all aspects of who you are. We invite all persons into full participant, full partic to be full participants and members in the life of our church family in leadership, worship, and fellowship. The human family is one of the greatest expressions of diversity in God's creation, and we celebrate that. Whoever you are and however you came to be here with us for worship today, know that we're glad you're here, and we want to know you're here. Please take a moment to do that. If you're worshiping with us on Sunday morning, you can do that in the live chat and our virtual pew pad. But if you're worshiping any other day or time, you can still let us know that you're here in our virtual pew pad. Both of these, the live chat and virtual pew pad, are great ways to let us know if there are any prayers that you have on your heart or mind so that we can celebrate together or be a support to one another. And if you're a visitor, our pew pad is an opportunity to let us know if you have any questions about our church community. The link to that can be found in the description of this video. Passing the peace is an ancient tradition rooted in scripture. Jesus himself would greet his disciples saying, peace be with you. It's a simple gesture with profound meaning. It may be momentary of your day, just a small interaction that you have, but it can have a large impact. It is powerful. It is a practice that continues to shape our hearts and minds and identities as peacemakers. In extending our literal or virtual hand to someone in peace, we are identifying with Jesus and the reconciling love that he sought to impart to the world. So I invite you, take a moment, share, a piece of, share the peace of God with someone in the chat, in an email, on Facebook, or drop a note in the mail for them. And may the peace of Christ be with you. Amen. So oh. 
for wholeness today, I will be drawing on the wisdom and faith of one of our Quaker sisters, Kathy Whitmire. Will you please join me in a posture of prayer? Forgiving God, help us to listen with the ears of our hearts to the voices of the marginalized who work for nonviolent social change. We pray that you will help us to recognize them as luminous spiritual guides in our midst who choose nonviolence. Even when their bodies and souls have been tried by inequity, oppression, and violence. We ask forgiveness for the times we have not heard their voices. May the stories of their faithful lives break open the hard ground of our hearts and nurture in us the seeds of justice and compassion. Loving God, fill us all so completely with your ever-flowing love that it rolls over the rims of our hearts and spills into the world in shared acts of peacemaking with those who have known racism, sexism, poverty, and violence. We pray for your help in living with kindness, making love the first motion in all we do, and in loving one another as brothers and sisters and siblings, because only then will peace follow us wherever we go. Prophetic God, Lead us up your holy hill, hand in hand, with those who are different from us. To stand watch together through the long night of these unraveling times. We pray for the strength and faith to endure as we work together in the social and spiritual gaps of this liminal time. Holding one another's children, sharing songs, and offering beams of hope by letting our collective lives reflect in the rising sun of this great turning, what the power of love can do. Gracious God, meet us and make your presence known to us in this time of silence. Friends, hear this good news. When we reveal our hurts, when we acknowledge our brokenness, when we confess our faith, God always responds with love. Because you are God's beloved, now and forevermore. Amen.
I'd like to invite the children of the congregation to gather your attention round, to use your listening ears. I have a question for you, and that is, what do you think God looks like? What do you think God looks like? This is something that people have been trying to express for as long as there have been people. For Christians, we read in the Bible that it says, no one has ever seen God. No one has ever seen God. That's what it says in the Bible. And so when we imagine, what does God look like? We imagine that in a way that shows about our values. And so, I would like for you to close your eyes and picture in your mind's eye what God looks like. Imagine a mother who loves her children. Imagine she loves them so much that she gathers them close to protect them. Or imagine a father who holds the hand of his children, guiding them through challenging places. Or imagine, imagine a rock, a great rock that is steady and strong and certain. Imagine the whole of creation. I, when I try to picture God in my mind, God is always so much bigger than what I can imagine. As you pray, children, whenever you pray, try imagining how God looks, but in different ways. Don't get stuck on one way of picturing God as some big man in the sky with a big flowing beard or something like that. Imagine God as you pray in many, many ways. Because God is so much more beautiful than we can imagine. And so by picturing many things, we get a little bit closer to what God might be. Good morning, people of First United Church. We have two scripture lessons this morning, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. The one from the Old Testament is from 1 Samuel. It's 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 through 13. This is probably familiar to some of you at least. This is the call of David to be the next king of Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I named to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And Jesse said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sacrificed, he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinabab and made him pass before Samuel. 
He said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shama pass by, and he said again, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons available before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Are these all your sons? And Jesse said, there remains the youngest and he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, rise and anoint him for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Our second reading this morning from the Bible is from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. This, of course, is a letter of Paul to the people of Corinth. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Blessed be to the reading of this morning's words of wisdom from our Holy Bible. Please pray with me. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts in all our hearts be acceptable unto you. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Christ. Amen. Being a minister, one question I frequently get is, how do I know if I'm hearing God's voice? God's ways are mysterious. There is no doubt about it. Um, our ancient witness reading this morning from the Old Testament inspires a sense of wonder about the narrative uh, illustration of God's power to take small things and small people like David the shepherd and make them great. Today I want to discern and explore the question of how do you know if it's the divine's calling for each of us, small people that we all are. The topic of discerning the call of the universe is of personal interest to me. I may have said this before, but after 48 years of work, my husband Paul retired, and I too am semi-retired. I have to admit that I have been much more anxious about retirement than Paul is. My husband Paul is able to live in the moment, taking each day as it comes, I, on the other hand, am used to a full calendar with something scheduled morning, noon, and night. It's taken me a while to appreciate the unstructured nature of retirement. It's also taken a while not to be bored without full-time employment. It's taken a while also to find our rhythm as a couple. I may have said before, but I have had to explain to Paul a number of times that I married him for life, but not for lunch. Um, I have lunch with my female friends, and we have our own things to talk about without our husbands present. I'm sure some of you can identify with that. On the other hand, Paul has been a real sport, as I have binged on Grey's Anatomy during the pandemic and since then. Uh, Paul is not a TV person to start with, and the, uh, why don't we just say the, the lascivious lo love lives of the characters of Grey's Anatomy <laughs> um, 
tend to drive Paul out of his mind. But bless his heart, he puts up with me watching it anyway. And I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I'm on season 16, and I think this year maybe was season 17. I don't know. Um, but uh, I've been enjoying watching Grey's Anatomy. Isn't that just mind improving? I have heard that the formula for a good retirement is to spend a third of your time learning, a third of your time volunteering, and a third of your time relaxing and having fun. The opportunities for learning are abundant here in Oak Park and in the Chicago area. Um, I have a friend that takes courses from Northwestern University. They have a great uh, cadre of courses for adult learners. And certainly there are lots of learning opportunities in the city of uh, colleges of Chicago and in our own universities and colleges that are right here in Oak Park. We have lots of ways to learn. Having fun is no problem. We have two granddaughters in Downers Grove who are always delighted to see us and uh, delighted to come to Oak Park and go eat ice cream and uh, play in the playgrounds of, of Oak Park and, and everything else. So having fun is uh, not hard to do. But then there's the, the third challenge of, you know, what, what to do uh, as a volunteer and volunteer opportunities. So uh, in retirement, I want to spend at least some of my time doing something that's important in the eyes of God. Um, and and that's, that's a lot harder to, to figure out what to do. In the story of David's anointing by Samuel as the next king of Israel, tension builds as God mysteriously instructs the prophet Samuel not to anoint the obvious choices, the ones the political consultants or pundits would choose today, the ones who somehow appear more qualified or capable, the ones that uh, have the best face faces for television, or the ones that are older or stronger or more impressive. Those would be some of the criteria for selection today, but certainly not in God's time. Surely God's anointed is now before the divine, Samuel thinks, as he looks at Eliab, the fine older son of Jesse. However, in some enigmatic way, Samuel understands that God is concerned with the unseen, the heart of the person, and the very center and core of the one to be anointed. So after rejecting all the older sons, Jesse was asked to bring the little one, David, who was out in the field shepherding the family's flock of sheep. Ironically, our text actually dwells a bit on the very thing that we are warned to ignore, David's good looks. These good looks will cause problems, as you might remember, for David later in life. Um, I think of Bathsheba and the mayhem that's caused because of David's lust. But when he is chosen, the little boy is a shepherd, and it's not unreasonable to think that he was a good one which seems to suggest that he would be a good king for Israel as well. David is good at leading the sheep, at least, to food and water. He's good at protecting the animals from thieves. He's good at tending their injuries, and he's very good at disciplining them. The anointing of David takes place while King Saul, who David replaced, is still on the throne. What's interesting about this fact is that it suggests that God is often providentially active even before others are aware of the needs. That claim might lead us to look to the story of our lives and the lives of our First United Church community and see God's hand at work in ways just as surprising, maybe just as unlikely, as it was in the story of David and the kings of Israel who followed him. Whose need might God be addressing through us? And even more interestingly, when in our first united church life did the divine become active 
when there was a need. What seeds did our God of wisdom plant long before the church body was consciously aware of a change of direction or ministry? I think that's kind of interesting to think about. What seeds were planted before even the congregation or the pastoral leadership of First United Church was aware that there needed to be a change in direction? I also have two other questions, and I don't have an answer for either one of them. I ask them as food for thought. Are there and were there potential leaders at First United or in Oak Park who have been kept from exercising their God-given gifts or leadership because they didn't look the way we expect a leader to look? We're told that we should look not with our eyes, but with our hearts. The various ways in which men and women in our and every age are tempted to do just the opposite can be documented in our racism, our sexism, and our various forms of idolatry, be it love of money, clothing, glitzy cars, and the like. Our challenge, of course, is to see beyond characteristics to the character within a person. Secondly, and even more importantly for us today, while we are not David and certainly are not destined to be rulers, I don't think we are, we will ask uh, another important question. What is my role in God's eyes and how will I be able to do what the universe calls me to do? The idea that the Spirit of God works through our circumstances and choices through the things that happen to us has given me a helpful perspective in which to view my own life and the lives of those with whom I journey. Perspective is important and sometimes it can be even more important than the reality of what we see. I was ordained 12 years ago, but I considered going to seminary for years before I actually took that first step toward ordination. What initially kept me running away from the call to pastoral ministry was the belief that I would have to become something I'm not. There are all kinds of stereotypes of pastors, I'm sure you're aware of them, that ministers are perfect people, that they're unbelievably pious, that they don't swear or drink or have fun, that they're always kind, these kinds of stereotypes scared me, and they kept me running from the ministry. I was afraid if I became a minister that my brain and personality, both, would have to be surgically or spiritually removed and replaced with something that might be called the pastor's package. I wasn't sure what that was, but I was equally sure I didn't want it. When I finally got up the courage, to go to seminary. I realized that God was calling me to be nothing more than who I was created to be. I hate to reveal the truth to all of you, even though most of you will not be surprised, but seminaries are full of very ordinary people, only some of whom eventually become ministers. There's lots of people in seminary who don't end up going into the ministry. Once I was in seminary, I felt a deep peace when it was clear that I fit in, that my past experiences and my passions and interests would shape the way I would live out my calling as a pastor. I wasn't weird. I wasn't non-religious. I was just me. The role of the Holy Spirit, urging us to try something that might be initially uncomfortable, can be a key in revealing what the divine expects from us. I recently began to see a familiar scripture with new eyes. In our first Corinthian scripture from this morning, the apostle Paul writes, Dear brothers and sisters, when I first came to you, I didn't use lofty words and brilliant ideas to tell you God's message. I came to you in weakness. I was timid and trembling. 
and my message and my preaching were very plain. I did not use wise and persuasive speeches, but the Holy Spirit was powerful among you. I did this so that you might trust the power of God rather than human wisdom. What strikes me is the phrase, I came to you timid and trembling. I'm thinking of my granddaughter Lily's first day of kindergarten. <sighs> Poor Lily. She was led into the classroom shop, just sobbing and shaking. She's now going into fourth grade and she's fine. But that first week of kindergarten was really rough for her. My heart was broken as I watched her. I was thinking about my first day when I was 18 years old at a summer job. When I sat in the car, my father drove me to work at the box factory where I was going to be working for the next three summers. And I sat in the car, timid and trembling. I couldn't make myself get out. My father finally had to kick me out and say, go and open that door. Um, I remember being on the bus, going to Girl Scout camp being full of fear. I distinctly remember the car ride to college, sitting in the back seat, not knowing what was to come, and feeling like I was falling into the abyss of the unfamiliar. I remember just recently, a year and a half ago, sitting in John Edgerton's office, right before the pandemic hit, talking to he and Alicia about how I might find a place to be of service at First United Church. That was not easy to ask for that appointment. That was not an easy conversation for me to have. But over and over again, the Holy Spirit moves us to try to try new things, even if we are timid and trembling and unsure of ourselves. No matter how small and powerless we may feel, no matter how unlikely or, un or unqualified we may seem to ourselves, we can still feel the power of God's Spirit at work in us and dream the dream that God has for this world. We look around and see the influence and the effect of others, and we realize that we too can be a blessing, both in our individual lives in the lives of others, and in the lives of our church. I think of Claudette Zobel, and Sue Cellini, and Cara Petrini, and Priscilla, and Ruth, and many, many, many other people who are just quietly taking those small steps to make First United Church a better place for all of us. There are so many large and powerful entities that surround us as individuals and as churches. First United Church seems small sometimes when compared to other organizations that attract time, attention, and sometimes the energy of our members. And yet, we know that at our church, hope lies beneath statistics and reports. There is potential lives in giving voices to the smallest persistent of witnesses, the evangelical courage and the extravagant hospitality that expresses our commitment and describes our deepest hopes, not only for our church, but for the world beyond our church walls. We do feel powerless sometimes when we are alone but we are strong together. That's why we go to church, and this is why we are people of the divine spirit. With strength and courage, we want to listen to the timid and trembling voice of the divine, the voice that urges us to move out of our comfort zone into even the tiniest crack of the unknown. Even as seemingly insignificant people, we can and we do make a difference. As quiet and as trembling as that still small voice is, I guarantee you that the Holy Spirit is in and among all of us. Blessed be 
Thanks be to God, and amen. calls us beloved, nurtures us, and gifts us with abundant grace. May we respond with our own gifts of love and generosity. Whatever our gifts may look like, whatever sum they might amount to, our gifts are well received when they are freely given. If you are able and would like to make a monetary gift to First United today, there are several ways that you may do so including online, by text, or by mail. And for all of the gifts that you share and give, we are so grateful. And may God bless your heart and hands. Amen.
what a gift it is. What a gift it is to be able to pray for one another, to know that other people are praying for us. This is a great gift of community, to be in prayer together. Even as we are in our different homes, it is a gift to pray together. You are invited to pray together in this time in a few ways. One of them is that you can share your prayers in the chat. If you share your prayers in the chat, then you will find that others read them and will pray them too. You can also simply join your spirits together in prayer because God, who hears all prayers, is binding and taking together and weaving our prayers even as we pray them. So would you now join me now in praying these prayers of the people? O most holy God, we lift before you now the people of First United Church. We pray for those who are in the hospital. We pray for Martha Sorensen, healing after a fall. We pray also for those who are grieving, for Mary Kay and for all of the children and family of Judy McCullough, who died so suddenly last weekend. Oh God, we are grateful for the life that Judy led. We are grateful for her presence here as a member of this church. We commend her spirit home to you and are grateful that she counts now among the company of the saints alongside her husband, Daryl. God, we pray for all of those navigating the changing circumstances of the pandemic who find shifting practices to take them by surprise. God, we pray for all of those, all of those in this community who are seeking connection and joy. Oh God, for all of these prayers, we know that you hear us. So listen now as we open our hearts and our spirits before you and you alone, who hears all prayers. Most holy God, when we have prayed with all of our hearts, when we have given all of our words and poured ourselves out fully in prayer, it is good to know that we may always pray and pray rightly in your sight, that prayer which your Son taught us to pray. O Creator, O Mother, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I have a few announcements for us as we conclude our time of worship together today. The first is that following this worship service is a congregational meeting. This is open to all members of First United Church. We will be taking up and hearing important reports. If you are looking for your Zoom invitation for that, you might look back to your e-blast from this week or prior weeks. Zoom invites would have been sent out to all members of the church to participate in this congregational meeting, which again will be following church today. Secondly, we have upcoming some memorial services that I want to make sure that everyone in the congregation is aware of. On the 24th, that is next Saturday, on the 24th, we will hold a public memorial service for Sherlyn Reed, who died earlier in the year. But because of COVID-19 problems, we only were able to hold a family-only service. So this public memorial service for Everyone in the town who would like to remember and memorialize Sherlyn will be held this coming Saturday on the 24th of July in the afternoon at 3 p.m. We'll be here in the sanctuary. We'll have the same precautions that we had last week for our indoor service. Masks will be acquired and social distancing will be observed and it will be a beautiful time of remembrance of an important figure, to put it mildly, in the life of this church and in the town of Oak Park. Also, the following week after that, on July 31st, on Saturday, also in the afternoon, we will be holding a memorial service for Carol Bergstrasser. Again, Carol's public memorial service had to be delayed until we could have a time of, of public indoor worship. And so the Bergstrasser family wants to be sure that the First United Church family knows that they would be thrilled to see everyone on the 31st in the afternoon. There'll be more details about that in the coming weeks. Friends, all of these things are possible because we in community love one another. Whether it is in our business, whether it is in memorializing our beloved saints, whether it is in the worship of God on a day-to-day -day basis, all of this is because we in community love one another and love God and seek to follow God's ways. Thanks be to God for the gift of being the church together.
as we leave church, as we leave this service on this, what I hope is a beautiful Sunday morning, I would encourage you to listen to that timid, that sometimes scared voice inside of us and step forward and do a new thing. The Lord will bless you and keep you. The Lord will make his or her countenance shine upon you. And our God will bring you peace. The Holy Spirit is with you today and always. Blessed be and thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you.